by 2020, the estimate of face recognition cameras will reach to more than 2.3 billion in China. And if you like a leader of the house church, your score would be hugely reduced. I personally used to hate Christians. I have never had a Christian friend, I have never visited a church, I have never seen a Bible in my entire life, but I was taught in the Quran schools to hate Jews and Christians. We in the West, we have the luxury of looking at it as something that will never touch us, but I think there are already signs that that kind of time might be coming to its end. come back to this question of why were they persecuted. We come to the Roman Empire and it's not so much because of anything that they do, but it's because of what they refuse to do. What do they refuse to do? They refuse to say that there are many gods. They refuse to say that the emperor is a kind of god. And actually, it's that refusal that is the reason for them being targeted. They are also a new group. There are many religions, there are many gods in the Roman system. Those are well known, but the Christians are like a new sect and there are wild rumors about them, about what they do. Horrible things are being said about Christians. And even though there are some periods when things are calmer, the persecution is not at the same intensity the whole time, but they are the group that you could pick as a scapegoat for anything that went wrong. I went to a government elite school. We were all Muslims. And when they came a Christian from Southern Sudan, he was the only student in the school who was from Southern Sudan and it happened to be a Christian. And he came and sat next to me, and he, his name was, was Zachariah. I hated him. I hated him because he's from Southern Sudan, a different culture. I hated him because he was a Christian. We caused him lots of problems. Like uh, in, in the class, whatever problem happened, it all ended up with him, you know. We hit him, we beat him, like nearly every single day. But what struck me, he was very nice. And then I thought, how can an unbeliever be so nice and so smart? You know, I had this picture about Christians are immoral, Christians are like the bad people. You know, morally, he was the best one in the class. And you insult him, he always smiles at you. You do bad things to him, he's never hitting back. And this actually struck me inside, you know, and I started even to hate him more because of that. And then one day I said to my friends, we need to kill the Zechariah. We need to kill him because he's a Christian, and we need actually to uh, clean the school from an unbeliever. And in one night, we attacked him. We attacked him in the wood, in the forest, uh, in a very dark night. He was walking under a tree, and we climbed on the tree and we waited for him. And when he came, we jumped on him, and we had our guns because we had a military training that time and we hit him so bad and he was crying, was shouting and one of the guys was um, um, like uh, putting his hand in his mouth, you know, and I was on the top of him and the other one, so we hit him so bad and he was almost dead, he almost died. And I said to 
my friends, okay, then leave him because we injured him so badly that he will definitely die. And we left him in the wood in the middle of this dark night so that he will die. And Zachariah never came back again to school. as an English teacher in the Chinese Communist Party school. During the daytime, I was teaching English to the Communist Party leaders, but during the evening and on the weekend, I was uh, riding my bicycles, basically uh, sharing the gospel, doing evangelism, and setting up Bible studies, and uh, then establish our own house church in the university areas. So that's the first time experience, I can see the Communist Party is very suspicious of Christians and they want to really discourage, uh, especially the college students, from believing. That security agent actually warned me, said, uh, if you uh, continue to believe uh, your superstitious Christianity, that's what he called, we would face uh, serious consequences. So that was the, my first time experience as a new Christian. So I realized it's not a kind of a easy new life, uh, even as a Christian, after being persecuted as a leader and a participant of the students' movement. In 2018, uh, the Communist Party enacted a uh, new regulation on religious affairs in the name of uh, sinicization. Literally, sinicization means to be more like Chinese, but in essence, it means uh, uh, to have any religion uh, under the absolute control of the Chinese Communist Party. We have uh, seen thousands of churches were being banned, demolished, and thousands and thousands uh, of crosses, um, of uh, even the government-sanctioned churches uh, their buildings um, were being uh, burned, uh, uh, demolished by force. So th these are uh, really uh, measures that, again, happened under President Xi Jinping's time. And uh, it's only becoming worse and worse. In 2018, we documented over 50,000 50, Christians were being physically and mentally tortured. We have documented, even with our limited uh, kind of investigation, it's really the tip of the iceberg, uh, what we have found. 2018 marked the worst year in 40 years against uh, Christians and Christian churches uh, in China. I think, uh, you know, President Xi's aim is uh, no longer uh, to control uh, or limit the activities of the Chinese Christian faith or house churches or even government-sanctioned churches. I think uh, he changed the policy from control to eradication and by 20 20, the estimate of uh, face recognition cameras will reach to more than 2.3 uh, billion in China. Like uh, almost uh, every Chinese would have uh, two like face recognition cameras following them uh, from their home to the street to the shopping mall to the workplace. Basically, the whole 1.3 billion people's uh, samples of blood, their DNA, uh, their uh, fingerprinting, uh, and uh, records uh, would be stored in one big uh, cloud services. And um, if you are like uh, registered or being put on the database as a Christian, your score would be of course reduced. And if you like uh, a leader of the uh, house church, your score would be hugely reduced. And if you have a traffic ticket, you would be even you know, subject to banning 
to fly or take a train. So this system is by far, I think, uh, the most sophisticated surveillance controlling uh, electronic system uh, in the whole world. Through these uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, so-called One Belt, One Road economic uh, initiative, the Communist Party is uh, expanding uh, its control, harassment, and uh, its uh, tyranny beyond its China border already. Until this Arab Spring started, somehow Christians in some of those nations were protected. Uh, for example, in Syria or in Iraq under Saddam Hussein, they had like a minority status. And everything actually has changed in the past, I would say, 10 years or so. And what happens is that when these governments have fallen, when these societies have become really unstable, that has actually not been a good thing for the Christians because an authority, a strong authority that was protecting them was better than a complete anarchy which we have seen. And what has happened then, for example, in Syria and Iraq, we had all these different um, armed militias or terrorist groups coming in and Christians were extremely unsafe. Their churches were destroyed many times. They had to leave their villages, or in the worst case, they were killed themselves. Many people think that now it's safe again for Christians, but it's not safe for Christians. And there are many Christians who have come to other nations in the Middle East as refugees, but they are not very safe even in the places where they have come to. There's a list of 50, the worst persecuting countries in the world. We know that the majority of these countries are Islamic, but there are other countries there such as North Korea, uh, China and India that actually are not Islamic, but we know that, for example, in North Korea, it's practically impossible to be a Christian and practice your religion. We know that in India, it depends which region you are living in. There are big differences between different uh, places. And we know that the situation in China is changing. And it's not just Christians, it's probably other minorities too that are being targeted. The uh, prediction is that the numbers of Christians that are going to be persecuted is rising. So that's very, very worrying. The numbers from different sources are a little bit different, but the number of Christians worldwide being persecuted, many say that it's 216 million. I personally used to hate Christians. I have never had a Christian friend, I have never visited a church, I have never seen a Bible in my entire life, but I was taught in the Quran school to hate Jews and Christians, even though I have never knew what they believe in. The problems happen in the minute when you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And the minute that you say, Jesus Christ died for me and rose again, and the minute that you get baptized. So when this happened, people got persecuted. They got persecuted from their families. They get persecuted from the, um, uh, from the Islamic uh, Ummah. They get persecuted from the governments. The word Ummah comes from the Arabic word Um. And Um means mother. And so like even in Europe, where like you have a free society, you have uh, laws, still people get persecuted from their own families. Because religion in the Islamic society is not a private thing. Like in the, in the Western society, religion is part of life. In our society, life is part of religion. This means the society, the ummah, is everything that you have. And you cannot live without this ummah, collectively. One of the biggest 
uh, element why persecution is so severe in the Islamic world because of this Ummah. You cannot break out of it. Even though my family, they were really fanatic Muslims, I had a very good family. So, and that's why my family was very important to me. So when I told my father that I became a Christian, and I used the word Christian, you know, and I think that was a problem. And that was the first time that I saw his crying. And then he said to me, we cannot accept you. And I had to leave home. That was one of the most devastating moment in my entire life. I walked out from my family and knowing never to be back again. And I, I remember these things as if it was yesterday. And the most painful thing was not just leaving. Like a couple of days later, I bought the normal newspaper that we have in Khartoum, just reading it. And then in the last page, I will see a big picture of me, my picture in the newspaper as a death announcement. So my family, they declared me to be dead. I no longer live. And not only that, they brought a coffin, they made a funeral, and they said, our son is dead. And they brought this coffin to the cemetery and they buried it there. And up to today in our village, there is a, a tomb in the cemetery, a grave in the cemetery where my name is written there. That was one of the moment which was very, 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 very difficult. So I was arrested several times. And the last time I was arrested, so I was arrested for seven weeks. They brought me to a place where they bring normally, uh, not just normal criminals, they bring those who are in opposition to the government. We came into this prison, and outside you could hear the screaming of people already. People are screaming got inside, people are being beaten up with cables, you know, tied on the walls. Men are screaming naked. And it was, it has a very bad smell. And I could still smell it as I speak about it now. I did not know from where the smell came. They brought me to a basement downstairs. It was very dark, no light came in. And they brought me in a small cell. Total alone, there's nobody there. When they arrested me, the only thing that I could take with me was my Bible and a handkerchief. Handkerchief was brought to me by a group from the YMCA from Germany. They were visiting Khartoum. I took this with me. And I was glad that I took it with me. Because this handkerchief became everything for me during this time. I use it as a pillow. I use it as a bed on the ground because the floor was so hard. So this room was so small I could not stand and I could not sit. I could not lay down and exchange. And this bad smell came very, very, very strong. So the next day when the guard was coming with his torch, bringing food to me, I would see like in the floor, so many dead bodies. So I went through a lot of persecution. 
But where did I find my comfort? I find my comfort actually in two things. First of all, when I start to recite or to read the Lord's Prayer. Like the Lord's Prayer starts, Our Father in Heaven. And there I got to know a God is not that the one who created me in His image and left me, but the God that I could call Him Father. There I found my identity and my destiny in it. And whenever I pray it, I pray it, I look to God as He's my Father that I could always come to Him. And I know a day will never come where this Father will tell to me, you are no longer my son. I think um, the definition of success is the key um, in the Western kind of uh, a free uh, world context. Uh, success, um, even in the church, always mean, oh, you are happier, you're healthier, you're richer, you know, go with your life uh, with less pain uh, and easier. So that's kind of uh, the definition of success. But the biblical definition of success is really to live a godly life every day in Christ Jesus, to be shining and uh, uh, kind of reflecting the image of Jesus Christ as you live a daily renewal life. Following Christ is going to cost us. And the most important thing, we need to know our Bible. You know, in that dark place where I was imprisoned, what carries me is the Word of God, not my emotions, you know, not the security that I have, but the promises that I have. When Jesus said, I will be with you every day till the end of time, you know, either I believe that or I leave it. I'm not very much concerned about what is going on in the Middle East. I am concerned about it. European society where everything is easy going and they are totally missing the whole meaning of life. As Christians we have to understand that to follow Christ this is the narrow way, not the wider road, you know, not, not the highway. Jesus said that very few that are going to follow him and the road is narrow, and Jesus said, in this world, you will have despair and you will have distress, but have courage that I overcome all of this. So Jesus never actually promised us to have an easy life. We have to understand that, you know, even in this easy situation where we live in. To prepare ourselves for the time of persecution is to learn from the persecuted church today. Maybe we need to lift up this topic more in the church, in our nations. How does it start? Like, how do you know that the society around you is changing? What do you do at the beginning when you still have more freedom of action? Because I don't think that we are so prepared. I don't think that we understand that the Western society actually has become very anti-Christian. Even the countries that traditionally were Christian countries. And it's very interesting because it's not because of something that we do. It's not that it's forbidden to read the Bible or to pray or to go to church. But it's more because of the things that you are not prepared to say or you are not prepared to do. And that's really how it started even in the Roman Empire. And I think we have to really to see these changes in the society around us and think about, not just about other people who are suffering persecution, but what does the possibility of persecution mean to me? And do I need to be somehow prepared? So in the midst of this challenge, 
Uh, do we compromise? Do we withdraw? Do we say, oh, I want to just uh, keep my faith uh, private and don't uh, uh, have my light uh, totally exposed uh, as Jesus uh, encouraged us to be the light and uh, hide my salt so that we lose our flavor uh, in the uh, crooked society. This society is not as secure as we think. And whoever put his trust in a system, in a political system or a social system, you know, he will be a loser at the end of the day. We need to start to practice and to put our trust in Jesus, even in this easy time. And then when persecution come, we are already living a relationship with Jesus. And only Jesus, and really only Jesus, could bring us through. So that's why in the persecution context, uh, it's like Jesus' parable. You are like uh, uh, being refined uh, out of the fire. And uh, the uh, kind of uh, um, uh, the testing uh, of your faith, uh, like uh, the first Peter said, uh, my brothers, don't be surprised uh, when the big uh, tribulation uh, comes to you. And um, kind of the Lord uh, will not only uh, sustain you, but also make your faith uh, stronger. And um, you went to prison, it's, uh, according to the earthly standard, it's hardly to, to be called a success. <laughs> and, uh, but when you come out of the prison, and knowing your faith has become stronger, knowing that uh, the Lord has won the battle, and knowing that uh, the kingdom of God has been expanded even in prison, uh, and I think in the eyes of God, and that's a huge success. You may not have that kind of um, shallow uh, happiness, um, but you will have that joy, and uh, Paul even called it unspeakable joy. If we look at the Bible, we look at the New Testament, at the very first believers, what do we actually see there? We see that they say that they were happy, that they were counted worthy of suffering for Christ's name. And I'm wondering sometimes in our culture and the way we are used to living, if we would ever count ourselves happy to be suffering for Christ's name, I'm not sure how we would pass that kind of test, but that was their attitude. Like they expected persecution, because anybody who wants to live a godly life is going to be persecuted. It does mean that there are certain situations where you have to choose and God's law is going to be more important than the law of the society around you. And I think that's very, very hard for a anti-Christian government to understand that you can be a loyal citizen at the same time, but then also you will always obey God more than those in authority. Uh, of course, you know, when you are realizing that uh, once you registered on the internet, then so you are marked. When you are realizing if you have any foreign relationship, you are marked. When you step out of your house and going for house church worship, the face recognition camera is following you. And uh, the whole internet, the cell phone are totally uh, controlled and uh, censored. So it's very scary. It's a, it's a total kind of a police state. Uh, it's, uh, in some sense, it's worse than the uh, Nazi Germany in 1930s uh, because they don't have this kind of technology uh, at the time, uh, and the Chinese Communist Party has. And so they are more careful in their communication. And people now have to use code language to talk about uh, their faith, uh, their relationship. But on the other hand, um, I think uh, after 70 years of Chinese communist persistent, systematic, non-stop persecution, I think they have that uh, kind of a, a residual uh, vigilance 
uh, knowing that, you know what, this is uh, the norm, uh, not only a biblical norm, that uh, we can't or we shouldn't avoid persecution because, as Paul said, anybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. So persecution is not a surprise to them. So they are still boldly, uh, I think, uh, proclaiming the gospel according uh, to the teaching of the scripture. If they are not allowed to go to uh, a church, they would establish their own house church. If the house church is being banned, they would uh, uh, continue to read the Bible and serve the Lord uh, in their homes uh, and uh, small groups. If they can't even have a small group, they would go to a, a, a boat, maybe have their boat church, maybe go to a cave to uh, restart the cave church in 1960s, and uh, go to a forest, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, if they can't do a daytime, they can worship at midnight. We have seen it in China especially, but also in Iran, that there's a huge growth of the underground church, and it is at the time of a very intense persecution. That is not to say that we want that persecution so we can grow, absolutely not, because it's a horrible, horrible thing, but it is to say that God is able to grow the church even in those circumstances. And that's why I see church growth in these countries where persecution is, is really um, is growing faster. And that's not because people don't have anything else to clinch into it, but because people there experience God every day. What happens here is that during the persecution, Christians, they cling to their identity and they cling to the Word of God. What carried me in this time were two things. The Bible verses that I learned by heart because I was not even able to read my Bible because I did not have any light. And the second thing what kept me alive, I was holding into this handkerchief every single day. And this handkerchief became like gave me hold not because of the practical use of it, but because of the Bible verse that was written in it. And it was this Bible verse, the Lord is my light and my refuge. And in this dark moment, He was my light and my refuge. And I could see that. I could see that even though the cell is so dark, but there I experienced the reality of Jesus being the light of the world. And that's what carried me. Seven weeks. I see what's happening in China what God has been uh, doing uh, is uh, more of a, a hidden blessing, uh, kind of uh, in spite of the persecution. After all, when the Communist Party took power in 1949, less than one million Christians existed in China after one and a half centuries of uh, uh, foreign missionaries, hard labor, uh, and even martyrdom in China. But in the past 70 years under communism, with non-stop persecution, with uh, the uh, animosity continues, the uh, revival and growth of uh, especially Christian faith has been phenomenal. I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, by all accounts, um, the uh, commonly kind of acknowledged number of Chinese Christians now is uh, over 100 million. So from less than 1 million to now 100 million, that's a 100-fold growth. So only God and His Holy Spirit can deliver that. 
And the secret is, uh, you know, the Chinese believers, uh, as I just mentioned, that uh, they know this is uh, not a surprising thing, so they are prepared. So they know that um, whether they are free or they are being imprisoned, the gospel will always prevail. So if they are free, they will continue to establish the house churches, preach the gospel faithfully. If they are imprisoned, they will continue to establish prison churches. Uh, let alone in the Chinese context, actually the persecution, even in quantitatively, it, it, uh, it grew the church uh, because many persecutors have become from Saul to Paul. And being amazed, you know, those who are persecuted um, that under them have such an amazing uh, dynamic life uh, after persecution. So many prison guards, uh, even prison officials, have come to follow Jesus uh, after the witness. You know, this kind of a faith, their God is real, their God is life. I think uh, that is uh, something, you know, maybe the, the church in the free world can uh, learn uh, from the persecuted church. I went the first time back to the Middle East after many years, and I went to Egypt, and I was teaching in Cairo in a seminary there. And then after my teaching was done, a southern Sudanese came to me uh, with his gray hair, and, uh, and he came to me and he started to speak to me. He asked me where I came from. I told him my name, my family name, and where I lived in Khartoum. And, and this pastor started to cry. And then I asked him, why are you crying? And then he looked at me and he said to me, do you remember me? I told him, I can't remember you. I have never met you. And then he would look me into the eye, straight into the eye, and he would say to me, my name is Zachariah. So that was this person that I almost killed one day. I met him 25 years later. And the minute he said his name, I saw his broken arm and his broken leg, and I saw the injuries in his faith, in his face. The injuries in his face where actually I damaged him. I saw his eye which was which he no longer see because we injured him. And it came a a silent moment where I didn't know what to say. I expected many things that he would say, but one thing I never expected to hear from him. Zachariah would look me straight into my eye and said to me, Yasser, because you hated me so much, you persecuted me so much, I always prayed for you. And on that moment in Cairo, in the year of 2007, I grasped why God was deal was a person like me. Because Zachariah prayed for me. I hated him, he prayed for me, persecuted him, he prayed for me. He moved his broken arm got his back, opened his back, he took his Bible out, he opened it, and in the first page, he wrote my name. And he was praying 25 years for me. That's the answer to persecution, to hate, is prayer.